seeking initial licensure uh, or renewal if they in career technical education. So this is exactly the other building above these. It's identical to House Bill 1770. It's been properly seconded. Are there any members of the committee have any questions regarding this legislation? All right. Any member of the audience wish to speak in favor or in opposition to the legislation? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Kathy Bircher with the Virginia Education Association. And we continue to oppose any legislation that would remove the study of teaching from our teachers. Um, and I will tell you, because I told her, my daughter said, please tell you this story. She's a 15-year-old, and so I have her approval, and she was funny. She's like, please tell them. Um, she is in a photography class, and the teacher quit mid-year. They hired a photographer and has no classroom management skills, and the first thing she did was removed all the cameras from the classroom because she couldn't get them under control. So we set up kids and teachers for failure, and we don't have teachers in the classroom, so we have this bill. All right. Mr. Smith? This is Chairman Thompson, Mr. Smith Association. Slow in getting up, we're in total favor of this bill and ask it to be passed. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, anyone else in the audience? All right. All those in favor of reporting Senate Bill 1583, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All those opposed do likewise. All right. Clerk will close the roll. That bill reports 13 to 4. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Donovan, you have Senate Bill 1026. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. This is really just a cleanup bill. This is um, in regard to the family contribution on a transfer grant. And there was a, um, a uh, difference in the budget language and in the code language. And in the budget language, it had been changed to 12,000 as the expected family contribution in the code, it remained eight and it caused some confusion in counseling students when they were matriculating, and so it's just a, um, all it changes is the number. And Delegate Massey, I believe this was identical to your House Bill 1965. That's correct, Mr. Chairman, and I would move to report Senate Bill 1026. Motion by Delegate Massey, and it's been properly seconded to report Senate Bill 1026. Any member of the committee have any questions regarding this legislation? Any member of the audience wish to speak in favor or in opposition to the bill? All those in favor of reporting Senate Bill 1026, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. Clerk will close the roll. That bill is reported 17 to nothing. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Senator. All right, we have two presentations we're going to hear, and then I believe Delegate Bell's elementary and secondary subcommittee is going to have a meeting as well. Uh, first up, we want to hear from some students. We always um, enjoy having students with uh, the House Education Committee. Joel, do you want to come forward and, and introduce the students that are with us today? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joel Landris with the College Board, and thank you for having us here this morning. Um, we have a couple of students from Rockingham and Middlesex that would like to come and talk to you briefly about their AP experience. They're here on the Hill because of... Um, Five school divisions in Virginia were recently selected as the um, College Board AP Honorable Districts, and those, just for your information, are Rockingham, Loudoun, Middlesex, <coughs> Rockbridge, and Southampton. And um, I believe actually Delegate Greeson has a special visitor today. Uh, his son will be joining us for uh, these meetings uh, this morning. Um, but anyway, I want to first introduce Addison Ritchie who's with Rockingham County uh, Public Schools. He's an AP student and a senior, so come on up, please. And Dr. Finn, the superintendent of Rockingham County Schools, is here with us, and always uh, good to see uh, one of the uh, superintendents that I have the uh, great honor and privilege of working with. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, and thank you, Chairman Landis, and the rest of the committee for letting me speak this morning. Um, like I said, my name is Addison Ritchie, and I'm a senior at Broadway High School in Rockingham County. And I'm going to speak to you this morning, um, giving a brief overview of the AP system and my career with AP. AP Berkman is college level coursework in high school that students can take that better prepare college bound students such as myself for the classes that they will eventually take when they go to higher level education. One of the main reasons why I decided to take AP was the subjects interested me. There were subjects on a higher level 
that instead of taking just regular U.S. history or a science class, I could take a college level class and really benefit from the experience that it would teach me. Uh, so my cl AP classes that I've taken is U.S. history, AP government, uh, micro and macroeconomics, and English literature and language. Um, in addition, with those classes for preparing me for the classes that we will take in college, they can also save us money. At the end of the year, there's an AP test that you can take, the score of one through five, and some colleges, if you score high enough on those tests, will let you validate that class in college, which will save you money on tuition, textbooks, and it'll free up your schedule to take more classes, either an elective or another core class that you have to get out of the way. Um, while the classes come with staying up late, very late many nights, either making a deadline or studying for a test the next day, um, for me it was worth it. I was driven by the fact that I could take college level classes in high school and so that when I got to college I would be better prepared for the academic rigors that I would face there in addition to saving a little bit of money on the side. As a former page, I'm glad to be back here in the Capitol, and I just want to thank you all again for your time. Well, Addison, we appreciate you being here, and uh, um, the Ritchie name is uh, well known in the Broadway area, so I'm pretty sure I probably uh, know uh, some of your uh, related relatives. So. Good to have you with us. Any questions um, about Addison by the members of the committee? All right, Addison, thank you very much. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also from Middlesex, we have uh, Jamel Reed, so thank you. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak this morning, Chairman. Um, I'm Jamel Reed, I'm from Middlesex High School, and I also attend Chesapeake Bay Governor's School, and I earned PE credits from there, but my AP classes at regular school have been greatly helpful in my career. Um, I recently, learned that I was accepted into UVA Go Who's. Um, <laughs> but I can attribute my success into getting in and throughout my high school career to AP courses. Um, the rigor that comes with the courses that I take, like AP Lang, I'm able to take AP Lang and AP Lit, AP Literature and AP Language and Art. So that has greatly helped me when writing essays for scholarships and getting into just college for the essays. And AP has really helped me throughout my career, as I know it's helped my cohorts and the others at my school. And thank you for allowing me to speak this morning, and I greatly, greatly support AP tests. And thank you, it saves me a lot of money, and other uh, students a lot of money when it comes to college, and I just want to thank you. Well, Jamel, thank you for being here. Uh, any members of the committee have any questions for Jamel? We appreciate you being here, and you uh, represented uh, Middlesex very well. We appreciate you. <laughs> Delegate Lingenfelter. So I'd ask Mr. Chair, what's your major going to be in at UVA? Um, I'm hoping biology. Biology. Yes. Well, good. Thank you. We need we need minutes. more. We need a lot of doctors. <laughs> yes. I am researchers. <laughs> so, so. Thank you. Any um any other questions, Joel? Yeah. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for your time and listening to these students this morning. Um, AP is a great program. You've all been very supportive over the years and appreciate that. And um, if you have any other questions, you have to answer them. But do not want to trespass on your time anymore. So thank well, you. we appreciate you bringing the students um, uh, to us and sharing their experience. And also want to say that I know those of us have been working with the department and the Board of Education as we look to transform uh, what high school and the high school redesign is going to look like. We do believe that AP is going to play an even more important role uh, related to uh, preparing our young people to more quickly prepare themselves and then also get the credits uh, that they need uh, to possibly have at least one year of um, uh, college under their belt before they actually get to college. And uh, we think that'd be a, a, great, um, a great thing. So we're working towards that goal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, next um, we have somebody that's um, not a uh, stranger to our committee. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Robin McDougall, who's the director of the Commonwealth Education Policy Institute at Virginia Commonwealth University. And she's going to update us on the annual Commonwealth Education Poll, which I know all of you all find um, very interesting. 
Um, she, um, we have uh, forwarded to each of your offices the PowerPoint so that you've got that um, by email. And uh, we have also have the summary of the poll. Uh, i copy that for you. But uh, we'll s turn it over to Dr. McDougall and, and uh, learn um, what we found out about the poll from this year. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for having me this morning. And I do understand the busy schedule that you guys have. So as the chairman said, you have an executive summary of the highlights of this year's poll as well. Uh, we will be providing to all of your offices the full poll as well, all 84 pages, because I know how much you love to look at cross tabs and uh, methodology on a Wednesday morning. But we will, we will get those to you today. But at, as the uh, chairman said, we have our 18th annual education poll looking at K-12 and higher education. This year's poll went out in the field uh, the first two weeks of November with over 800 adults across all five of our regions um, reached out to and responding. And this year, we're gonna break it up into three major categories for you. We're gonna look at funding, we're gonna look at performance, we're gonna look at policy, and then within that policy, we're also gonna talk to you a little bit about safety. So when we look at funding and we look at K-12 funding, once again, um, we see that our respondents across all five regions see the importance of funding K-12 education and really believing that there is not enough uh, financial support for our K-12 institutions across the Commonwealth. So with over 60% of our respondents showing that um, they think there should be more funding put toward K-12 education. And they directly link this to quality of education. So over almost 70% of our respondents believe that the amount of money that we spend on public education from kindergarten through high school impacts the quality of our students' education. So you can see that tie between the, uh, where they view the levels of funding and their overall quality of education in the Commonwealth. And then when we ask that important, what I refer to as the rubber meeting the road question, are you willing to pay higher taxes to increase school funding. We see that over half of our respondents are willing to pay higher taxes to increase school funding in the K-12 arena. We're gonna also talk to you about what they said about higher ed as well. But there is this interest in paying more taxes. Last year when I presented to the committee, there was a question about, well, where would they like to see those taxes raised? And what we see is there's a strong support for increased sales tax if you were willing to pay more taxes and it was going to uh, K-12 education. So we did ask that question this year for the committee. And then every year we look at uh, asking the question about support, where would you like to see your tax dollars broken down? And this year, uh, public education, public schools, K-12, and mental health services are right there at the top. Uh, I would point out that many of our respondents kind of tie the mental health service needs into the public school environment. So we really do tie public school education and mental health services as number one in where they would like to see their tax dollars spent uh, in the Commonwealth. And then as we move forward to one of the interesting questions we asked, because you remember that first question about do you think the current level of funding is adequate for K-12 education? And our respondents said that it was not. When we asked the question about taxes to increase funding, but interestingly enough, almost 70% of our respondents would be willing to pay more taxes to at least maintain the current levels of funding. So we see that as an important tie to that question that I brought forward, that second slide that talks about the importance of funding and quality of education that our students are receiving in the classroom. So you'll see that about almost 70% of our respondents are willing to pay higher taxes to maintain the current levels of funding for K-12. And then still slightly more than half of our respondents would be willing to have their taxes increased if the funding went to increasing K-12 uh, funding for our schools. When we ask the question about higher ed, one of the interesting things that we see, um, or excuse me, not higher ed, uh, taxes with our high, high poverty, low performing schools, which clearly has been in conversation over the past years in the General Assembly and this year is no different. 
We asked the first time this year, would you like to see any of your tax dollars diverted to high poverty, low performing schools? And almost 70% of our respondents were very supportive. And that was across all five regions, which is really important considering that not all five regions necessarily are experiencing the high poverty, low performing schools at the same rate. So that importance of increased resources to our high poverty, low performing schools is resonating with our taxpayers across the Commonwealth. And then where they would like you to utilize those resources, um, if you are to look at paying, increasing resources for our high poverty, low performing school, schools is around teacher pay. Um, about 44% of our respondents, so not quite half of our respondents, believe that our resources and increased uh, economic resources for K-12 education should go to teacher pay. This was the, the first time we'd asked this question in a couple of years to see where they would like to see those resources go. So, in <clears throat> teacher pay is clearly the area they'd like to see that broken down. Now, when we flip to taxation and higher education, it was an interesting question to have this year around, would you be willing to pay higher taxes for your taxes to go to higher education? And there was support for that. Uh, over half of our respondents were willing to pay higher taxes, but in case that their increased support for need-based financial aid for college students. So that seems to be the direct focus of our respondents around their tax dollars being used in higher education is around need-based financial aid for college students. So that premise of, of trying to reduce the cost of, um, of, of college education in the Commonwealth was resonating with our respondents. And then in that follow-up question, we asked about the non-state dollars. Where would you like public universities to use their to place their non-state state taxpayer dollars? And over 70% of our respondents want them to be placed in reducing tuition and fees. So there's this consistent um, em emphasis from our respondents on that reducing the cost to the student and the family to go into uh, colleges and universities in the Commonwealth. Now, last year we had some questions from our, uh, from our college presidents and university presidents around workforce development and training, as well as from our Secretary of Commerce and Labor. And so we asked about state funds for economic development, clearly a hot topic this year in the General Assembly as well. And you'll see that in our respondents, when we talk about workforce training and education, that is where they would like to see the resources and economic development placed. So almost half of our respondents would like to see the state utilize their incentive funds and economic development around workforce training and education. So uh, it was an, an interesting tie to the importance of our two-year and four-year institutions for the preparation of our workforce and education of our students moving into the workforce as an incentive for our economic development. Moving from taxation to performance, which is kind of where we talk about the outcomes of our students. Once again, we should be very proud in the Commonwealth. Um, our high schools are doing an outstanding job of preparing our students for our two-year and our four-year institutions. Almost 62% uh, it breaks down of our respondents believe that when our students leave high school in Virginia, they are prepared for college, either at the two-year level or the four-year level. Our respondents do not think our college, our high school students are prepared to enter the work world. Only about 36% of our student, of our respondents believe our students are ready to move into the work world, but they do believe they're well prepared for college. And as you heard from our wonderful students right before me, you can see uh, those AP classes are really preparing them well for that also. In our two-year institutions, we should once again be very proud of our community college system. Over 70% of our respondents believe that when our students graduate from our two-year institutions, they are ready for the work world. So you see that jump from high school to the completion of our community college system. What our community college is doing is an outstanding job in preparing our students to enter the work world. They are also doing a very good job of preparing our students to transition with our, uh, with our transition plans into our four-year institutions to finish that bachelor's degree. So over 85% of our respondents think when our students graduate from our community colleges and they come into our four-year institutions, they are ready to hit the ground running and do an outstanding job. And then in our traditional four-year institutions, you see over 70% of our respondents, so remember across all areas of the Commonwealth, across demographics, 
believe that when our students leave our institutions of higher education in the Commonwealth, they are ready to enter the work world. So that is something to truly be proud of here in the Commonwealth. And we've seen that kind of response year after year, slightly increasing each year in that preparedness. So that's an outstanding outcome for us. We did, the, um, the chairman mentored the restructuring of high school, so we did ask that question this year about what people thought about this high school restructuring. And there was over 75% of our respondents liked the idea of the early grades focusing on what we refer to as the general skills and the latter grades focusing on either the career preparation or the college preparation. So this idea of high school redesign is not a foreign concept to our citizens of the Commonwealth and it's something that they are very interested and supportive of. <coughs> Um, when we look at outcomes of our higher education, so we talked to you about the fact that over 80% of our respondents believe that our students after leaving our institutions of higher education are ready for the work world. When we break down what those skills are, you can see that we're doing an outstanding job preparing them for those STEM types of careers. Uh, as our young man who's looking for that biology degree at UVA is a testament to, we're doing a great job of that, but we're also doing a great job of preparing what our citizens think are the work skills needed for the jobs that are currently in the workforce. And then we always like seeing that over 60% of our, our respondents believe our students are getting well prepared in their writing and communication skills. That's something that universities across the Commonwealth have focused on very heavily in the last few years. And at VCU, we have done exactly that as well. So it's really nice to see those strong numbers in written and communication skills. And then this year we added a new question, courtesy of some of our college presidents that said, one of the other things we believe occurs in our two-year and four-year institutions that we believe is our job is to prepare our students to be engaged citizens. So when we asked that question to our respondents, over 60% said that yes, they believe that when students leave our institutions of higher education, they're more engaged and more focused in what it means to be an active citizen in the Commonwealth. So that was very nice to see as well, that we've got those, what we refer to as scientific and hard skills covered, as well as what we consider those more soft skills about engaged, engaged citizenry. So a very nice overall perspective of, of what we're doing in higher ed. The last questions um, that we talked about were policy reform ideas before we get to school safety. So we did talk about teacher pay since we saw that high response for wanting tax dollars to go to uh, increasing teacher salaries. So we asked about low performing schools um, and actually over 70% of our respondents believe that teachers who choose to work in high poverty, low performing schools should pay, be paid more to assist in that fully accreditation process. So increasing the incentive for teachers to work in and teach in those high poverty, low performing schools is something that's deemed very, uh, very interesting and very appropriate from our respondents. Uh, we asked the virtual learning question. So this is the online education question that we asked um, in previous years, looking at it again, where does, the, where does it kind of fall out? It seems that a majority of our respondents are very comfortable with their students having some options uh, for online education in high school. So 56% of your respondents want their students to have some of their classes that they can take online. But important to point out that only 14% are comfortable with having all of their children's high school education done online. So unlike what we're seeing in some of the higher education arenas where you have the entire experience online, in the Commonwealth, even though it's a, a very important idea that people are interested in and they're very supportive of, they do believe that some things need to occur in the traditional classroom. So there's very strong support for partial online education for high school. And then, uh, oops, last one, sorry, I, I double clicked there. The other reform question we asked is about charter schools. And last year we had presented to the committee um, that people were very supportive of the charter school idea in the Commonwealth, and they still are supportive of that. But we got some requests to ask the next deep dive policy question, which is, but would you be supportive of a constitutional change in the Commonwealth to allow for that increased independence? And so when you look at that question, you see a little less support. There is still support for charter schools, but it sort of splits 
um, in the middle. So there, there are 40 percent of our respondents are supportive of that constitutional amendment change, uh, and 45 percent are not. Now, I would say one caveat to that is many of our respondents were unaware that it required a constitutional change, and so there was a lot of education of our respondents about what that meant. Um, so, so I do point that out because it's the first time we've asked the question. Uh, we did get some very standard language for our for our pollsters to ask those questions, but I do draw that to your attention. It's the first time we've asked the question and to explain the mechanisms that that occurs in. But it was, I think, an important next step for that charter school conversation. And then lastly, we want to talk about campus safety in our K-12 schools as well as our, as our institutions of higher education. Once again, just like we're doing an outstanding job preparing our students in the classroom, we're also doing an outstanding job keeping them safe. When you look at uh, our K-12 institutions, all of our, so when you add 27 and 51 together, you've got almost 80% uh, of our respondents think that our public schools are safe or very safe. And that means that they think that we're keeping our teachers, our students, and our administrators safe on campus during school activities, as well as in those after school activities and sporting events and other types of uh, uh, events. So think about the fact that we asked this question in November, the um, unfortunate incidences that had occurred around the country at that time, and yet in Virginia, across all five regions, uh, people believe that we do an outstanding job of keeping our students stay safe. And we see no difference in our institutions of higher education. Uh, we see that same exact level of support, and this year, even stronger support for our school, our universities and colleges being a very safe or safe environment. And so once again, this includes what's occurring in our classrooms, what's occurring in our dorms, what's occurring in our extracurricular activities. So the Commonwealth should be very, very proud of the safety and security that they're not only providing to students and, and staff and professors, um, and administrators, but that our citizens, most often parents, um, translate that to see it as a safe environment. And with that, I would love to take questions. And we have some. Please, thank you, sir. <laughs> delegate Massey, then Delegate Grayson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a uh, question for uh, Dr. McDougall and then a, just a statement, too. Um, Dr. McDougall, um, on the back of your handout, page six, you spent a lot of time talking about the results of your poll. Um, do you have, but you don't spend much time talking about the sample, so do you have the information uh, that would give us, you know, education levels, yes, professional sir. on the 806 adults in your representative sample, and would, yes, you, yes, would you please sir. distribute that to us? Yes, sir, I will, and I love I when someone asks a methodology question on a Wednesday morning. It makes the research methods person to me so happy. Yes, sir, we have it broken down by race, uh, gender, age, household income, party affiliation. Um, if you are a parent of a school-aged child, if a parent of a child in college, so I will give you in your full report that's coming around today, we'll have that all broken out for you, sir. Broken out with percentages. And with percentages and by each question. There's actually, um, that's why that document is 84 pages long, unfortunately. In the back, there is a cross tabs by each demographic breakdown for each question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick um, The gentlelady uh, talked about the online, that, that only 14% of uh, parents would be interested in an online education. I would point out to the committee that 14% of 1.2 million kids in the state of Virginia would be 168,000, 170,000 kids that might be interested in attending Delegate Bell's uh, full-time virtual school. Uh, I would so uh, that would be the biggest school that would be the largest school in largest K twelve school in the state of Virginia if only fourteen percent of people attended if half of them attended it would be uh, you know eighty five thousand so um, the chairman why it's only fourteen percent that's a whole lot of kids and when you add on our homeschool kids charter kids our education improvement scholarship tax credit kids uh, so on and so forth I think you see that school choice is a big piece of, uh, of, our, you know, of our efforts to, uh, uh, to give our kids and our parents all value-added options uh, in the state of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Brees and then Delegate Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to see you again, Dr. McDougall. I really enjoy this presentation every year. 
Um, I want to go to funding. Yes, sir. Um, so I, if I follow the charts, the average citizen or respondent would say we don't fund enough. Um, the second part of it was majority would be willing to spend, uh, excuse me, pay more taxes. Um, once that occurs, they want that money to go to the teachers. The next questions, um, for what? To retain the teachers, to recruit teachers, um, to uh, have a better result in performance. And so I would love to kind of understand, and I'm not going to articulate what, what I think. I would love to know if you have that cross-tab information or if that's something we can look in. Most people, I think, just say generically, we should pay our teachers more. But I think it's our responsibility to say, and what's the return on that investment? We, uh, any of the three that I already mentioned. So what are your thoughts on that? And does the poll get to any of those deeper uh, related questions? So it, we just asked the general question in those categories just because of the way the opinion poll works. However, that being said, we do have some previous year breakdown. We had some questions around teacher pay about three years ago. So I'll be able to provide that for you. So it won't be 2017, but it'll at least be three years um, past. But more importantly, it's a question that we can easily add next year in the poll for that next question. This was the first time we put back into the scenario of where would you like those dollars to go? So the follow-up question would be absolutely perfect. Where do you want to see teacher pay put toward? And we would break those categories down. So one of the things that you all were wonderful to help us in this year, we sent the poll question, or sent some questions around, you guys gave us some feedback. We'll do that same thing next year, and would love your feedback on how those categories should look as well, Delegate Reason, so that we make sure we cover all your categories. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mr. Chairman, may I just, um, to Delegate Massey, one thing, and it has to go also with uh, Delegate Bell's very large virtual school that I hear you're now running, cur courtesy of Delegate Massey, we can also break the, that 14% down by region, and one of the things I think you'll find is exactly what you're talking about. Certain regions, that number is even higher, so those cross tabs show you where you see that um, disproportionate impact of interest in a fully virtual high school. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Delegate I just would like to point out if only half of the kids uh, attended it, it would be the largest by far school in the state of Virginia. Exactly. Thank and you. you can see where those interest areas lie by region too. Yes, sir. All right. Delegate Bell, then Delegate Lincoln Felker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. McDougall, thank you for your work. Yes, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, Mike, I guess this, is, this part is more of a statement, uh, but I'll try to make a question out of it. A uh, narrow majority is willing to pay higher taxes uh, to increase school funding. I hear that a lot from my constituents. I hear from people across the Commonwealth. And the problem has always been um, they say that until it's time to do that. And then they break out the pitchforks because they don't want anything. So it, is there a way to um, incorporate a question to suggest uh, another alternative means of funding or to suggest without raising taxes um, where do we take the money from to put it in education um, you know two-thirds of the people say that uh, in your polling say, say that uh, uh, funding for K-12 is not enough and I hear that a lot too and I, I don't I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but what I'd really like to know is what is enough? Mm -hmm. Because it's, all, it's always more, we need more. Um, and, and maybe we do, but how much more? Um, at what level? There has to be a ceiling somewhere. Um, so what, what is enough? That's a great question, and as you can imagine, um, I, in my household, heard similar things about hearing that they're, uh, you know, always want to pay more taxes, but then the pitchforks come out. So I do understand that. Uh, we did we did not this year, but we do have some questions about um, in four years ago about where would you like to see reductions occur? So if we weren't going to bring in more revenue, where would you like to see the reductions occur? They most often match up with where you see those um, interest and where you want your tax dollars. Um, so you'll see that they're, you know, they want reductions out of criminal justice, out of Prisons is a specific area that we see. Um, transportation has popped up. It used to be they wanted transportation dollars taken for education. Now there's change there. 
but you bring about a good question about asking them other options that are might there. So that's something we can bring forward next year. We have not asked the what is the appropriate level question, uh, only because we found sometimes that you end up leaving your respondent because you have to give them some categories and naturally they pick the highest category. But that being said, we are willing to do some research on now that there are many places around the country looking at what appropriate funding thresholds are to see if we can find some, some recommended language to run by you for next year. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, well, I, I, I just think it would be useful to the people who have to make the money decisions uh, to know what some of the, the thoughts are among those people who, who are saying we need more all the time. And again, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with them, but it's easy to say we need more. Uh, it's not as easy to say we're going to buy more. Exactly. There really is no golden goose. Without a doubt, or when they start to actually get an increased tax bill um, that doesn't always line up with want versus action. You're exactly right, sir. So we'll see what we can pull for you and get that to you as well. Yes. Okay, Delegate Lingenfelter. Mr. Chairman, I've got a couple of questions about parental <coughs> involvement, and you may, Robin, have already looked at this in some detail, but um, does your, when you do your sampling, do you sample out for talking to parents with kids in the schools? So we uh, make sure that our sample doesn't get overrepresented with having everyone that has kids in schools, but that each one of our five regions has a uh, close to equal number of adults that we're responding to that have kids in school and those that don't. So that when we give you our breakdowns, we're able to show you what parents of children think, you know, currently versus not not currently having a child in either K twelve or high school. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could, the delegate Lincoln, and you're the scientist in this group, not us. But one of the things that I've discovered in just talking to people in general over sixteen years is that you know. Parents are the stakeholders. They are the real consumers in education. We always think about the kids being the right. consumers. It's the parents that are the consumers because it's their children who are being educated, and so they're consuming that result. And so I'm always very interested in what they think specifically. And sometimes people outside of the schools sometimes give you a slightly different view because they don't have a stake in it beyond the, the state, the general public has an education anyway, workforce and so on and so forth, all the things that we do care about, but it's a little different when it's your kid in the chair. And so a couple of questions there, Mr. Chairman. Oh, um, uh, parental involvement. I, I would be curious to know if, if you have or if you will be willing to look at the level of engagement parents have with their kids while they're in school, things like you know, do you, how much time do you spend with your children in, in say, homework? You know, how much time do you spend, you know, how many times do you actually go and sit down with the teacher over the course of the year? Um, and, and I think that's really important. My, my wife, who's now retired from education, uh, used to say that really probably one of the most important aspects of educating the, the kindergartners that she had was are parents at night reading to their children? Are they taking the time, or is everybody crashed after a long day's work and you know they got the TV on, fall in front, fall asleep in front of it? I mean, we are we engaged in that kind of thing because without parental help, it really makes it difficult for the kid to be all they can be. And the other thing I think it would be good for us to look at, Robin, was is the the attitude among parents about the trade track versus the four-year track. You know, we've dealt with this sort of dilemma that, oh, I, my kid's going to be in the trades, that's a bad thing. That's a false view, in my view. The, the, the kid, there may be kids who are extraordinarily bright who simply want to go to work. They want to get into the workplace and they want to be properly trained. And so I would be curious to see what parents think about trades versus four-year and, and sort of dive, dive into that. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, the last point would be this. Um, I have put three of my kids through Virginia colleges. They've all 
done remarkably well. They're all very bright kids taking after their mother, I might add. And all three of them have told me that they felt that their high school preparation was not sufficient to help them wrestle with the rigor of a four-year institution in Virginia. And these kids are taking AP. What a great testimony that is. I would be curious, have you ever sampled sophomores and asked them what their view was having a year behind them? Did, what was it about their high school education that either prepared them or did not prepare them for the rigors of a four-year school? So you got any thoughts on those ideas? So the parent engagement is a great one, and we can surely look at how we could frame a question like that next year. Uh, we've not asked that in the past, just because we've usually done broader scale policy, but your, your point is, is well taken there. We do have, um, in previous year polls, and it's about five years ago now, we have some conversations that we've had with folks around career planning and trade versus four-year institutions, because I agree with you wholeheartedly. The, the um, misassumptions around the importance and utilizations of certificates and trade programs are, are a lot of times stigma stuck on the parents, not the children. You know, the children know what they want to do. So we can pull those for you and look at maybe re-entering that next year. Your question about sophomores, so not in this poll, but universities have done them and VCU has done some where we've looked at sophomores and our idea of how we better prepare our freshman year students. And being a college professor who teaches intro classes to freshmen, I agree that it is not the academic performance, it is the other things that come with college many times, managing the multiple classes, the hours, the homework, um, the freedom that sometimes students uh, have to learn to, to master. Uh, so I do, we can look to see if any of uh, Chev has put anything out, but we'll also look around the country for you like I think we did last year on a question for you to see if there are any good polls that look at what sophomores in college. Because we do a random sample um, of adults, it is really hard to target college students just because how do you define where they are? You, do you, you know, when you do region, and, because they're at VCU, but they live in Tazewell. So that's just a methodology challenge. But I will look to see what data is out there that might help you get at that. Because I do agree, um, one of the things that we've seen on some of the redesigns and some of the four-year institutions are looking at sophomores and saying, what are the, some of the things we can do? And then I know we fed some of that back to the high schools as well. Well, Mr. Chairman, final point. I'll take it, Langham the, the, the two areas that I have the most interest in it is, is our fundamental math mm -hmm. skills, you know, because it's a, you know, I loved calculus and analytical geometry so much, Mr. Chairman, that I took it twice. <laughs> and, and, um, and then I became our twice. Then I took, you have to take it twice. Then I <laughs> the cool twist of fate, the Army made me an artilleryman and really threw me in my rhythmic tables and so forth. Um, and the other thing is English comp. Um, I, I think that if you look at if you look at writing in general, I think that we've got more work to do there to prepare. You talk to college professors, they will tell you quietly without you know hitting the front page of the Richmond Times that kids can't write. And so we we really need, I think, to look at those two areas in particular because they're so vital for a college education is to be able to write well and to be able to do fundamental math. I would agree, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions? Delegate Massey? Yeah, I have just one final uh, thought, Mr. Chairman. I've got the golden goose for the tax issue for Delegate Bell. Uh, the golden goose is the U.S. economy has not grown at a rate of 3% or better for 11 years in a row. The last time that happened was never. It only happened for four years during the Depression. The Virginia economy, which has always outgrown a faster rate than the U.S. economy, is now growing slower than a very slow growth U.S. economy. The Virginia economy grew 2% in 2015, grew less than 1% a year for the prior four years. So the answer, the golden goose, is economic growth and economic growth in the state of Virginia. And I would tell you as a, a businessman for all these lives, the fact of that slow economic growth is a self-inflicted poor public policy wound. So the state of Virginia's tax revenues are only growing one, one and a half percent. They ought to be growing four and a half to five. 
If we had good tax reform and good regulatory reform, and every one percentage point of growth, as the chairman knows, would generate $200 million a year in additional growth. So we were running at four and a half. Instead of one and a half, we'd have $600 million a year more. And we compound on top of that every year. So we quickly, uh, there's your goals and goose, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, Delegate LaRock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, Delegate Bell's comments uh, about uh, messages that say fully funded schools bring me to mind the signs I see on the main street of the town where I uh, shop for groceries and drive all the time. I, I think the sign would be more appropriate if it said fully educate our children. But um, your question uh, on the question here, which relates higher taxes to school funding, is, is certainly a, a fair and accurate question. But it sort of plays on the inclination to think that uh, um, funding and improved outcomes are directly related, which I don't think is but an assessment that I would say is absolutely correct in all instances. Um, so I know you don't do push polls, but uh, given that there's data that makes it clear that school choice saves lots of money and, and it delivers measurable, improved results, uh, would it be fair to ask you to consider a question that would be something like, would you support education choice options as a way to save education dollars? It would surely be a fair request for me to include. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Dr. McDougall? All right, thank you very much. We always appreciate the, uh, the uh, input and, and uh, I think all the members really like uh, getting this report every year, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And as I said, you'll all have copies with your legislative aides this afternoon of the full 84 pages that I know will entertain you in your methodology review. Delegate Yancey, did you have a question? Um, no, Mr. Chair, I just want to briefly note that Senator McDougall, I mean, uh, Senator Reeves was waiting to know you were in here as an additional board. Well, we uh, have an elementary and secondary subcommittee meeting immediately upon adjournment of this, so. Uh, that is why I think they're here. All right, Delegate Lamonia. I just wanted to uh, ask Dr. McDougall, who's now saying, is there a way we could get that presentation on a web link so that we don't have a big file to pass around by email? Yes, sir. I will send you, so on the, the actual web link to the actual report is on your executive summary in the back. Yes, ma'am. It's right there, and right. that'll take you right to the full report. And the PowerPoint um, will, is being emailed to you as well, just so you have the actual PowerPoint also. Okay, great. Yes. And if you're on the elementary and secondary subcommittee, don't leave. You're going to be meeting a media upon adjournment. Um, is there any other business to come before the full committee? Entertain a motion to adjourn. And there's a second. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. All those opposed, 